Okay, so this is the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and sympathetic, or the nervous system that we can't physically have conscious control over, the one that works on its own. So the autonomic nervous system is a self-governed system, meaning that we do not control it. It works on its own, whether we tell it to work or not, it just does its own thing. We cannot regulate it, like we can't tell it, oh, slow down our heart rate, speed up our heart rate, um, increase our body temperature. We don't have any control over that. The autonomic nervous system does that all on its own. Um, sometimes it's referred to as automatic because autonomic and automatic sound very similar. It's an easy way for you to remember that the autonomic is the one that works all by itself. It regulates things that are fundamental life processes. So things that if we stop doing, we would die. Our body does not rely on us to keep telling our heart to beat because it knows if it stops, we won't be living. So things like heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, and breathing are part of the autonomic nervous system. Breathing is one of those ones that we do have some voluntary control over, but if we stop focusing and telling ourselves to breathe, the autonomic nervous system will take over and make us breathe. So some general properties of the autonomic nervous system are that it is a motor nervous system, meaning it sends signals from the brain out to the body to make it do things. Um, it sends controls to things like glands, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And if you remember, the smooth muscle is the muscle that lines our intestines and our esophagus, things like that. Um, this is also referred to as the visceral motor system, so the one that we do not control that tells the body to do things. The primary organs of the autonomic nervous system include um, the thoracic and abdominal cavity organs, cutaneous blood vessels, so blood vessels in the skin, sweat glands, and erector muscles, the ones that make your hair like stand up on your skin. Those are all part of the autonomic nervous system. We cannot control any of those things. You cannot control how much you sweat or how little you sweat, if you get goosebumps, if your blood flows. These are all things that we don't have any control over and they are all part of the autonomic nervous system. So again, the autonomic nervous system is going to carry out involuntary actions um, with or without conscious intent. So whether you are thinking about doing it or making your body do it, it's going to happen. Um, you don't even have to be aware that it's happening. It just happens. Um, so the visceral effectors do not depend on the autonomic nervous system to actually function. So your brain doesn't have to keep telling the neurons, make the heartbeat, make the heartbeat. The heart will beat already on its own. The autonomic nervous system will step in to regulate the heart rate. So if your heart is beating too slow and you need more oxygen or you um, are cold, your heart rate needs to speed up. The autonomic nervous system will step in and say, hey, speed up that heart rate. Or if your heart rate's too high and it needs to correct it and slow it back down, it will step in and slow it back down. So all these things work on their own automatically and the autonomic nervous system regulates the rate and how much these things work. So it helps your body maintain that homeostasis where it's at that perfect balance internally and out and externally to keep it functioning at its like best possible level of functioning. So we have these things called visceral reflexes. These are unconscious, automatic, and stereotypical responses to a stimulation, and they involve the visceral receptors and effectors. So unconscious means we don't control it. Automatic means it just happens automatically by itself. And stereotype means it's an expected reaction. So we know what's going to happen. It's usually the same type of reaction for the same type of stimuli. So the receptors are nerve endings that detect stretch, tissue damage, blood, chemicals, body temp, and any other internal stimuli. Um, those are the receptors, so the things that get the stimuli. The afferent neurons lead to the central nervous system. So these are the neurons in the body that lead back to the brain and the spinal cord. The integrating center is the interneurons in this, the central nervous system. So these are the neurons between the neurons that communicate with each other. They don't send the signals, but they communicate. The efferent neurons are the ones that carry away from the spine um, and brain. These are the ones that send signals to your body and tell it to do things. So afferent is to the brain, efferent is away. So in a visceral reflex, um, a stimuli is going to hit one of your internal organs, or something like that. So let's say your bladder has stretched so far and now you have a stimuli to um, tell you to go to the bathroom. 
So that stimuli is going to get sent to the, the central nervous system by afferent neurons. And then the nervous system is going to take that and comprehend that and send it information back that says, hey, go to the bathroom through efferent neurons. So one goes to and one goes away from the brain. Effectors are the things that actually carry out the end response. So after you send the, the signal back, the things that actually do it, so the things that are going to actually tell you to urinate are the effectors because they carry out the efferent neurons signals. And the ANS is considered an efferent pathway because it controls certain organs. We're not sending signals back to the brain. The brain is telling the organs to regulate themselves, speed up the heart rate, slow down the heart rate, speed up, speed up the breathing, um, elevate your temperature. Those are all signals coming from the central nervous system. So it's going to be efferent. So the autonomic nervous system, the ANS, is actually the part of the nervous system that has the fight or flight response. And it's broken into two divisions. So we break it up into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, we talked about this briefly, but let's go a little bit more into depth. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is the actual fight or flight response nervous system. So this is the one that preps you for running away from a bear, um, when you get anxious or nervous, this is the system that takes over when you almost wreck your car and you have that nausea feeling and your heart is racing. That's your parasympathetic nervous system. It's prepping your body to be able to fight or flight. So what it does is it decreases all of the unnecessary functions, slows everything down, and then concentrates on putting energy towards all of the functions that you're going to need to basically survive the situation you're in. So your heart rate is going to speed up because you need more oxygen to make more ATP. Um, you're going to start breathing heavier to bring in more oxygen. It's going to um, start bringing up your blood glucose levels because you need sugar to make ATP. It's going to slow down blood flow to the skin and di digestive tract because we don't need to be digesting food right now if we're trying to run from a bear. So it's going to prep you for life-saving measures. When all of that is done and you're no longer in danger of dying, you're parasympathetic division is going to kick in and say, hey, we're okay, let's calm the body down and get back down to normal like functioning. So this is going to be the calm down. It's going to decrease your heart rate, decrease your respirations, um, turn your digestion back on, and all of these things. Go back to normal. Everything that was decreased or sped up during the sympathetic is going to be undone with the parasympathetic when everything is back to normal. So after you wreck your car and your heart is racing and you feel sick, 20 minutes later you're back to normal because the parasympathetic division took over and regulated everything back the way it should be. So these things usually work in opposition of each other. One, one works when you feel like you're in danger and the other one works when you feel like you're safe and undoes everything that the other one does. So the ANS maintains this thing called autonomic tone. And this is the normal rate of like background activity that represents a good balance of the two systems working together. So this is your everyday normal balance when you're just doing your everyday normal things. You're not all upset or anxious or nervous. Um, the two systems are nice and balanced. Parasympathetic and sympathetic are both working at a normal rate and everything is balanced. Parasympathetic tone maintains the smooth muscles in your intestines. So that's the one that maintains your digestion and all that kind of stuff. Um, it keeps your heart rate about 70 to 80 beats per minute when you're at rest. So that's the normal heart rate. And then the sympathetic tone keeps your blood vessels partly constricted and maintains your blood pressure. So one maintains your heartbeat and one maintains your blood pressure. The sympathetic division excites the heart but inhibits digestion and urinary functions. Well, the parasympathetic does the opposite. So the parasympathetic will slow down the heart and speed up the digestion and urinary functions. So they're always going to be opposite of each other when they are working. Um, when they're at tone and they're just working normally and it's nothing crazy going on, one maintains your heart and your smooth muscles, and the other one maintains your blood pressure in your arteries and veins. So the autonomic nervous system, or the ANS, has components in both the central and peripheral nervous systems. And if you think about what the autonomic nervous system controls, you can kind of think about which components of each nervous system it would like include. So control of the hypothalamus and other brainstem regions would obviously be the central nervous system. And if you remember, the brainstem is the part of the brain 
that controls the life necessary functions like heart rate and things like that. So of course the autonomic system, the autonomic nervous system is going to have a huge control over the brainstem. Um, motor neurons in the spinal cord and the peripheral ganglia are also controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Um, nerve fibers that travel through the cranial and spinal nerves could also be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So if you look at this uh, diagram of parasympathetic and sympathetic and kind of what it controls, not all of these things are part of the central nervous system. So yes, everything off of the spinal cord and the brain directly is going to be the CNS. But if you think about sweat glands and blood vessels in the skin, some of the reflexes um, in your knees or your elbows or things like that, those are all obviously going to be peripheral nervous system because they're not connected directly to the brain or the spine. The reflexes are going to come from those peripheral nerves. So the ANS has control over an aspect of both nervous system. It's not just the central. So dual innervation, let's talk about that. So dual innervation just means that the part of the body is getting nerve fibers from two different parts of the nervous system or two different types. In this case, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic divisions, both are sending nerves to the same viscera or organs. So if you think about why that would be needed, it makes sense. If you have a fight or flight response and your sympathetic nervous system takes over and your heart starts racing, how is it going to slow down if the parasympathetic can't send signals to it as well? So if they're going to work against each other and opposite each other, they both need to reach certain organs. Most organs have that are affected by this um, autonomic nervous system have nerve fibers from both sympathetic and parasympathetic. So they usually have an antagonistic effect, meaning they work in opposition of each other. So what one does, the other does the opposite. Um, or they have cooperative effects. So two divisions act on different effectors to produce a unified effect. Um, both decisions do not normally innervate an organ equally. One is going to have more control over an organ than the other. So for example, the parasympathetic is going to have more influence on the digestive organs, and the sympathetic has a greater effect on the ventricular muscle of the heart, and the ventricle is the part of the heart that squeezes to pump blood to the body. So the sympathetic is your fight or flight, and it would make sense that it has more control over the heart because speeding up the heart is like the number one way to get someone ready for fight or flight. We need to make more energy, we need to get more blood flowing, we need more oxygen. So having control over the heart is really, really important. The parasympathetic is going to have more influence on the digestive organs because once they are shut down, it has to be returned back on. Sympathetic doesn't really care about digestion. It doesn't have any effect on fight or flight. So it's like, okay, go away, shut down. We don't care about you. Parasympathetic has more control of turning it back on. So one has more control over certain organs than the other. Um, and they either usually have an antagonistic effect or a cooperative effect on the same organ. So let's talk about antagonistic effects. So these are the ones that are opposite each other. So um, they are exerted through du dual innervation of the same effector cells. So for example, your heart rate decreases with the parasympathetic and then it increases with the sympathetic. They do opposite each other, one undoes the other. Um, they're exerted because each division innervates different cells. So they innervate the same organ, but different cells of that organ. So the pupillary dilator muscle of your pupil is a sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so what happens when your eyes dilate? The pupil gets big and it does what? It lets more light in. So if you needed to run from something, it would be important for you to see better. So the pupils are going to dilate so you can see more clear to get away for life-saving measures. The constrictor pupillae constricts the pupil and this is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, when these effects happen, the effector nerves are going to different cells. One's going to the pupillary dilator and one's going to the pupillary constrictor. So that's how they have opposite effects on each other. Although they innervate the same viscera or the same organ, they are targeting completely different cells of that organ. That's how they have the different responses. So cooperative effects is when the two divisions are sending signals to different effectors but the responses are similar and they achieve the same goal or a very like similar goal, a unified result. So parasympathetics, so the one that slows everything down, is going to increase salivary serous cell production, which is going to make you salivate or drool, basically. 
the sympathetics are going to increase your salivary mucus cell secretion. So it's increasing saliva mucus. So one is increasing serous saliva and one is increasing mucus saliva. They're both increasing saliva. They're both going to wet the mouth. So even though they're targeting different cells and they're different parts of the autonomic nervous system, they have a similar result. So that's a cooperative effect. Some effectors receive only sympathetic fibers. So things like the adrenal medulla, which is a gland. The adrenals are above your kidneys. And we talk about uh, endocrine, we'll talk about those a lot. So these are the glands that sit right on top of your kidneys. The adrenal medulla, the erector muscles, the sweat glands, and many blood vessels are only under control of the sympathetic fibers. So these are things such as regulation of blood pressure and routes of blood flow are only controlled by the sympathetic. Um, the adrenals are really big in white or in red blood cell production, so it makes sense that they are also controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. Your sweat glands, when you're in fight or flight and you get really, really nervous, you start sweating. Um, so the parasympathetic doesn't turn on and turn off that sweating. The sympathetic just fades over time and it's not a strong simulation to make you sweat anymore. So the sympathetic vasomotor tone is your baseline frequency of sympathetics, like how often it's fired or the brain tells it to happen. Um, just that normal everyday functioning without anything crazy happening. This is a baseline frequency. So this keeps your uh, vessels in a state of partial constriction. It can constrict them more or dilate them more by either increasing or decreasing how often it fires and sends those signals. Um, it can shift blood flow from one organ to another as needed. So during stress, your blood vessels are going to switch to skeletal muscle and heart while the ones to the skin constrict because nobody cares about the skin if we're running from a bear. So it can either increase blood pressure, decrease blood pressure, increase how fast the heart is beating, decrease how fast the heart is beating, and then direct the blood flow to where it is more important during these situations. And that's all the sympathetic tone. And um, this can be changed by increasing how frequently those signals are being sent or decreasing how frequently those signals are being sent. When it's just that regular baseline, normal, sending frequency it's just the sympathetic vasomotor tone so control without dual innervation um, the sympathetic division prioritizes blood vessels over skeletal muscles and heart in times of emergency so if there is an emergency and you are on flight or flight fight or flight your sympathetic division is going to prioritize blood vessels to your skeletal muscles and your heart. It is not going to worry about getting blood to your skin or to your fingers and toes. It's worried about getting that blood to your calves and your tibialis and things like that. So you can run into your heart because you need to speed up your heart rate to make more energy so you can run. Um, blood vessels to the skin are going to vasoconstrict, meaning they're going to get really, really small to minimize bleeding if you get hurt, and also because we do not care about oxygenating the skin right now if we are trying to run from a bear to save ourselves. So uh, the autonomic nervous system is regulated by several levels of the central nervous system. The cerebral cortex has an influence over anger, fear, and anxiety, and those are all going to be things of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, powerful emotions are going to influence the autonomic nervous system because of the connections between our limbic system and our hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is the major visceral motor control center. So this is the thing that controls your hunger, thirst, and sex drives. Without the hypothalamus, you would not have the desire for these things or the drive for these things. So it's primitive functions like life or death. What's the most basic things humans are going to need? Food, water, and reproduction. That's your hypothalamus. So the autonomic nervous system is regulated by many different levels of the central nervous system. The midbrain, pons, and medulla all contain the nuclei for cardiac and vasomotor control, salivation, swallowing, sweating, bladder control, and pupillary changes. And remember, I told you guys that the brainstem was the part that was responsible for like the life necessary functions, heartbeat and stuff like that. If you damage your brainstem, usually ends up in death because you, you don't tell your heart to beat anymore and it's not anything that can be fixed. So these things are controlled by the brainstem. And then the spinal cord reflexes control things like defecation and, ur and micturition, which is urination. So going to the bathroom. Um, these are all from the spinal cord. So somebody that has a spinal cord injury could very well not be able to do that. 
and they would have to either catheterize or go on a bowel program where they stimulate the bowels like once every couple days. Um, that's usually what happens with spinal cord injuries. They don't have the signals to release the sphincters for those things that happen anymore. They can't tell it to go. It doesn't work. There's no signals being sent. Um, so we control these functions with our skeletal muscle sphincters. And if the spinal cord is damaged, the smooth muscle of the bowel and bladder is controlled by autonomic reflexes built into the spinal cord. So they still work. You just can't tell it to go. So you have to stimulate it either with a catheter or a bowel regimen. Um, and it's usually like a stimulation of the bowel to get it to go. So drugs and the nervous system. Drugs in the nervous system are really, really important together because most drugs affect the nervous system and you have to be very, very careful which drugs you give and when you give them because they can have life altering or either lethal effects based on what is happening in the nervous system. So neuropharmacology is the actual science branch that studies the effects of drugs and medications on the nervous system. Um, so there's sympathomimetics, which mimic the sympathetic nervous system. So they're going to enhance your sympathetic activity. Um, so these would be anything that the sympathetic nervous system, these drugs are going to make it stronger. So increasing your heart rate, increasing your sweat, increasing your respiration, slowing down your digestion, all of these things are going to be those sympathomimetics. They're mimicking that fight or flight nervous system. So cold medicines that dilate the bronchioles or constrict nasal blood vessels are going to be those. So it's going to dilate the bronchioles, which are the tubes in your lungs, to make you have more oxygen coming in, breathe more. And it's going to constrict the nasal blood vessels because it doesn't care about getting blood to the skin of the nose if you're in fight or flight. Um, so we can use these nervous systems to our advantage if we know what we're trying to accomplish. And if we can, like with cold medication, who would have ever thought that constricting the nasal blood vessels would help? But it really does. So using the nervous systems to kind of treat things is really helpful if you know what you're trying to achieve and what the medications can do. So you have sympatholytics, which suppress, they go against the sympathetic activity. So they're going to be more of like the parasympathetic type. So they're going to reduce your heart rate. Um, they're going to open up your blood vessels. They're going to uh, slow down your breathing. They're going to increase your digestion, those things but they're not acting on the parasympathetic nervous system. They're specifically acting on the sympathetic, giving it parasympathetic-like responses, if that makes sense. So it's triggering the sympathetic nervous system, but it's slowing it down or suppressing it so it doesn't make the heart rate go up and the respiration rates go up and so forth. So certain kinds of drugs can affect the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic, so mimetics are going to enhance the activity. So if you look at the name, it sounds like it's mimicking the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's exactly what it does. It enhances the activity that the parasympathetic nervous system does. So if you think about the parasympathetic nervous system, it's going to be a calming thing. So these drugs are going to be like your calm downs, anything that makes you more relaxed. The parasympatholytics are going to suppress that activity. So these are going to be the ones that keep you from not coming down. So they're going to be a little bit more upper like, um, many drugs also act on the neurotransmitters in the CNS. So if you think about what neurotransmitters do, those are the things that are in those neuro, um, like the synaptic clefts, the neuro muscular junctions between neurons and muscles. They're in those junctions between the neurons. If the neurotransmitters are not there, the signals do not get transferred from one neuron to the next. So essentially, when they act on the neurotransmitters, they act on the sending of that signal and they stop the signal from being sent. So Prozac is a very, very common depression drug. It actually blocks the reuptake of serotonin to prolong its mood elevating effect. So it stops the neurotransmitter of serotonin from being like re-upped in the brain, which keeps you from being depressed. Serotonin makes you like chill and relax, but too much of it makes you really, really sad and like somber. So it blocks that. Um, caffeine is going to compete with the adenosine and bind to its receptors, which um, adenosine is something that makes you sleepy. So if caffeine binds to it and it doesn't let it, you know, um, the brain has receptors for caffeine and if, or the brain has receptors for adenosine, but if caffeine binds to those receptors, 
the adenosine cannot bind to those receptors, then you don't get the sleepiness. So caffeine is just like it, it blocks the way for the adenosine. So the adenosine, it's like an outlet. If you have an adenosine cord and you need to plug it in, but something else is already plugged into that outlet, you can't plug it in. That's what caffeine does. So it keeps you awake because it doesn't let your brain get those I'm tired receptors from the adenosine.